Good evening. Tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about animals in literature. And I know that this is a topic which brings forth many gnashing, furry, sentimental reactions. And I would love to know if you have favourite animals in fiction that you would like to share with me. I've already had quite a few people sending in thoughts and I'd love it if any of you have favourite animals in fiction that you want to tell me about and I'll share with you as we go along which animals in fiction people are particularly excited, aerated or traumatised by. So this is going to be a fun and possibly occasionally contentious topic. Not sure how long I'm going to wear my animal hat because I might get a bit hot. But I feel quite wolfy this evening. There's wolves in literature who I love, as well as many other types of animal. I think I'm going to take this off because it is a bit ridiculous. Um, so... The animals that I'm not going to talk about just while people are getting settled are the fantastical ones and the very metaphorical ones. So I'm not going to talk to you tonight about Kafka's Metamorphosis, for instance, because that's all about a man becoming a cockroach in a very extreme, fantastical and metaphorical fashion. I feel maybe that's a topic for another evening. I'm also not going to talk about the amazing demons in Philip Pullman's wonderful Northern Lights trilogy, even though I love those animals and think they are particularly wonderful demons, but they are metaphorical again, magical, fantastical, and they represent one side of somebody's character. They are a person's other half. So they're not real animals in the sense that I want to talk about tonight. So tonight's animals in fiction are all going to be real fictional animals. And I'm going to start with Charlotte's Web, because who in their childhood was not affected by this incredibly moving, beautiful and fabulous book by E.B. White, which is all about a very brave, clever and self-sacrificing spider. It's a classic children's novel published in 1952 with illustrations by Garth Williams. It's a very widely read tale that takes place on a farm and concerns a pig named Wilbur and his devoted friend Charlotte, the spider who manages to save his life by writing about him in her web. And I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with this story, either from the book or from the film. If you've never read the book, it's an absolute classic for any age. It won't take you that long to read. And I completely recommend it for a really gorgeous book that makes you fall in love with spiders. And I am so not a spider lover. I actually am quite traumatised by spiders from an early age. And a book that can make you love a spider has to be an amazing thing. So um, another book from my childhood, which I found deeply influential and inspiring, uh, which is full of dogs, is The 101 Dalmatians by Dodie Smith which is, again, an absolutely gorgeous book, which lots of you will know from the film, but you must read the book if you've never read it. Dodie Smith, such a fantastic writer. Um, also someone I frequently recommend for her amazing and brilliant book, I Capture the Castle. And in this book, we fall in love with the 101 Dalmatians. We also fall in love with the parents um, as well as all the puppies. It is fantastically illustrated. And this is the book that I always remember as the first book I ever read to myself, which is why it's probably also got under my skin so deeply, because it's a book 
that I read at a young age. And I remember being absolutely, completely gripped and entranced by and absolutely living in the moment with those dogs, becoming those dogs. It's one of the first books when I literally became the creatures and the, the humans and the animals in that book. And there's one particularly memorable scene where the dogs are on the run. They're looking for their poor puppies who've been stolen by the dreaded Cruella de Vil. And they go into a house where they sit in front of a fire and a dog that befriends them gives them pieces of toast, hot buttered toast. And it's incredibly vivid. And I remember drooling at the hot buttered toast along with the dogs, which they were eating in front of the fire. And that became a template for something that I saw as being perfection in life, being in front of a fire, eating hot butter toast, which was toasted on a fork um, in front of the fire. I'm trying to wear my animal coat for you this evening um, to be full of animals. And I think I will put this back on intermittently just to remain in the animal vibe of the evening. So children's books uh, are obviously particularly full of animals and many a children's book is one that remains with you forever. If we were to talk all about children's books, it would take the whole hour. And so I think maybe we should come back to children's books another time, Damien, that would be rather fun. But just to mention a few amazing animals in children's books, there's so many cats. Mog, the forgetful cat, love her. Um, Meg and Mog, so many cat books. Orlando, the marmalade cat. Also, um, Julia Donaldson's fantastic books full of wonderful creatures, such as The Snail and the Whale is one of my favourite animal books, in which the snail rather like Charlotte in Charlotte's Web, saves the day by writing, a tr she writes a trail of slime across a blackboard in a class and thus saves the life of a whale. And this is actually not dissimilar to what Charlotte does in Charlotte's Web. So The Snail and the Whale by Julia Jonathan is another absolute classic not a um, children's book in which the snail and the whale are completely wonderful and highly memorable and important characters. So children's books are not to be sniffed at in terms of being incredibly profound and meaningful and books that remain with you forevermore. But tonight I'm going to focus more on adult literature containing um, animals. I w must just mention the Just So Stories, which are wonderful books all about animals by Rudyard Kipling, which are very strange and peculiar and beautifully written stories, which again, if you've never read, you absolutely must. And they have wonderful titles such as How the Whale Got His Throat, how the camel got his hump, how the rhinoceros got his skin, how the leopard got his spots, the elephant's child, the beginning of the armadillos, how the alphabet was made, the cat that walked by himself, and the butterfly that stamped. Those titles are enough, they're like poetry in themselves, making you want to read those stories. And Rudyard Kipling does have an interesting writing style. He talks to you, the reader, as his best beloved. And they are very mesmerising to read aloud. They're absolutely fantastic stories, which I would highly recommend that you try reading aloud with someone that you live with. Tonight, pick up this book, find the cat that walked by himself and read that one aloud. It won't take you that long. It's only about 15 pages long. And it's a, it's a story all about that enigmatic creature, the cat, and why it is the way it is. But I would very much urge you to read these. 
they're kind of templates for existence in a sense uh, in that they describe how animals came to be the way that they are using Kipling's imagination and they're really interesting they touch on very deep stories from hundreds of years ago but they are absolutely unique to Rudyard Kipling in the way that they're told and how the elephant got his trunk is one that's particularly compelling in which a crocodile stretches an elephant's nose because he starts off with quite a little nose he stretches his nose until it's as long as the traditional elephant's trunk now is quite traumatizing in some ways so that's the Gilso stories which I just had to mention there even though we're not talking about children's stories and another couple that I just wanted to mention before moving on to adult books are The Knife of Never Letting Go by Patrick Ness which is a young adult novel and this contains Manchi the dog who is the best dog ever in literature. I know that's a high title and I know there's a few others that I'm going to mention tonight that might be contenders for that title but Manchi is the most devoted and loyal and self-sacrificing dog and I love this book. Um, for people don't, that don't know it, it's a book set on another planet in which everyone can hear each other's noise, they can hear each other's, each other's thoughts, they can even hear what animals are saying to each other. So Manchi the dog, one of the first thing that he's saying in the book is, need a poo Todd? Shut up Manchi, poo, poo Todd? I said shut it, that's the very beginning of the story. And Manchi is a simple soul, but he has very deep and complex emotions and we completely love him. Believe you me, by the end of the book, he is a very, very noble and very good dog. I will be talking about a few other dogs this evening, but another one I must mention as a young adult novel, which has a very interesting dog, is Lady My Life as a Bitch. I'm only going to mention it briefly because it is a transformation story and I did say that tonight I wouldn't be talking about transformation stories, I'm going to be talking about real animals and in this story the girl who is the heroine, who's only 15, turns into a dog and she becomes a bitch and she has a pretty wild time as a dog and I won't tell you too much about it, but obviously her parents are really worried about her because they don't know what's happened to her. They don't know that she's turned into a dog. It happens right at the beginning of the story. It's a quick, breathtaking and very panting, doggy, licky kind of read, which has quite a lot of dirt, muck, hormones, running and fur in it, but really interesting. So, um, just to mention, I'm also not going to mention this evening uh, books about chickens because I'm going to save them for a special session just for Damien, all about chickens in literature because I know that Damien is a big chicken lover. I too am a chicken lover and have hens in my backyard and they star prominently in many a grown-up novel as well as a children's one and um, I will be returning to hens in literature but this evening I'm just going to talk to you about a few classic brilliant and amazing novels which have great animals in literature and I will also be mentioning later the books that you've chosen as your favourite animals in literature too. So one cannot have an evening um, talking about animals in literature that doesn't star this classic Moby Dick which many of you I'm sure have read and it's all about one man's obsession with a whale. Just for anyone that doesn't know the story or hasn't read it 
Moby Dick, is about Ishmael, the narrator, who announces his intention to board a whaling vessel. He's made many voyages as a sailor, but none as a whaler. He travels to New Bedford in Massachusetts, where he stays in a whaler's inn, and he has to share a bed with a harpooner from the South Pacific named Queequeg. At first, he is repulsed by Queequeg's strange, grim habits and shocking appearance. Queequeg is covered in tattoos. But Ishmael eventually comes to appreciate the man's generosity and kind spirit, and the two decide to seek work on a whaling vessel together. They then take a ferry to Nantucket, and that's where it's the traditional capital of the whaling industry. They then secure berths on the ship, the Pequod, which is a savage looking ship adorned with the bones and teeth of sperm whales. They hear of the mysterious Captain Ahab, who's still recovering from losing his leg in an encounter with a sperm whale on his last voyage. So this book is the story of an obsessive quest by Ahab, the captain of the Pequod, who is seeking for revenge against Moby Dick, the giant white sperm whale that bit off Ahab's leg at the knee. So it is a spooky, sinister, albino whale. There's many aspects of the book which may be rather unrealistic. However, it has been hailed as one of the strangest and most wonderful books in the world, the greatest book of the sea ever written, and its opening sentence, Call Me Ishmael, is among world literature's most famous. However, when uh, Melville wrote Moby Dick, it was not a hit. He started writing it in 1850, finished 18 months later, which seems amazing considering the magnitude and density of the book, that it only took him a mere 18 months, considering how influential, epic and huge a book it is. And I know many a writer who struggles with a book for years on end. This seems amazing that it took him such a short time. However, I think many would agree that it could have been edited quite a lot. Um, so he drew, Melville drew on his own experience as a common sailor from 1841 to 44, including several years on whalers and on his wide reading of whaling literature. The white whale, which uh, Moby Dick is based on, is modelled on a notoriously hard to catch albino whale, which really did exist, called Mocha Dick. And the book's ending is based on the sinking of the whale ship Essex in 1820. The detailed and realistic descriptions of whale hunting and of extracting whale oil, which can be read in a deeply scientific and uh, biological way, as well as life on board the ship among a culturally diverse crew, are mixed with an exploration of class and social status, good and evil, and the existence of God. The book's literary influences are pretty massive, and it has been one of the most influential novels ever written. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of quotes from the book. So Moby Dick, great book with a massive noble beast in it and also a lot of fascinating facts all about whaling, whales, all the things that you can do with parts of whales in a way probably not for the faint-hearted because it really does get deep into the blubber literally. Here's a quote from Moby Dick. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp drizzly November in my soul, Whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every <clears throat> and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping off into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. 
that's a quote from Moby Dick and I just want to read you one more little quote from Moby Dick because it really is an incredibly beautifully written book and even now um, I've seen tweets coming up of people reading it and being absolutely blown away by it and saying it is one of the most magnificent strange and mysterious books that they've ever read. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide underwater, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of its most remorseless tribes as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this and then turn to the green, gentle and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land, and do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee, push not off from that isle, thou canst never return. So that's Moby Dick. Uh, I thought I'd start with a good, big, fantastic beast from the sea. But in contrast, I would now like to talk about a very different kind of book. That book is all about obsession, seeing Moby Dick the whale in a highly negative way. Ahab is obsessed with the whale being his nemesis and he's obsessed with trying to kill and destroy it. I now want to move on to, in a way, the complete opposite kind of a book, uh, which is a very different kind of bibliotherapy. So here we have The Friend by Sigrid Nunes, which is a very lovely book about a great Dane. I'm going to have to remove this hat again because it's way too hot. Sorry about my rather flat hair. Um, trying to be quite animal-like and really just having slightly mad hair. However, we're going to have to go with that. So The Friend by Sigrid Nunes is a moving story of love, friendship, grief, healing and the magical bond between a woman and her dog. It's a beautifully written, really very unexpected, quiet kind of book, which begins with a woman unexpectedly losing her lifelong best friend and mentor. And she finds herself burdened with the unwanted dog that he's left behind, who is absolutely enormous. He is a great Dane. And she had no idea that her friend was going to leave the dog to her. And she lives in a flat in New York, in an apartment, where she's not allowed dogs. What can she do? She has her own battle against grief, which is intensified by the mute suffering of the dog, who is traumatised by the inexplicable disappearance of his master. And they are both equally traumatised by the threat of eviction because dogs are prohibited in her apartment building. While her friends worry that her grief has made her a victim of magical thinking, the woman refuses to be separated from her dog, who becomes very much her dog, even though he's mourning the loss of his previous master constantly. She refuses to be separated from him, except for very brief periods of time. She becomes isolated from the rest of the world, increasingly obsessed with the dog's care, determined to read its mind and fathom its heart. And she becomes dangerously close to unravelling herself. But while travels abound, rich and surprising rewards lie in wait for both of them. So this is a really lovely read. I think it's a great book to read when or if you have been bereaved because it's very much about grief and loss the strange way that it hits you the way that it sweeps up on you unexpectedly and the unexpected benefits of being left something which you didn't think 
you were going to be left in this case a giant great dane i'll just read you a little section from it it's also written in a most intriguing way quite a lot in the second person in which uh the narrator who is unnamed is writing to her dead friend which she is at this moment you had in fact emailed me about the dog that you found early one morning when you were out running standing on an overhang silhouetted against the sky the biggest dog you'd ever seen a harlequin great dane no collar or tags which made you think that purebred though it was it might have been abandoned you did everything possible to find its owner and when that failed you decided to keep it your wife was appalled she's not a dog person to begin with you said and dino is a lot of dog 34 inches from shoulder to paw let's just imagine that for a minute 34 inches from shoulder to paw that's nearly three foot high a uh, 180 pounds attached was a photo the two of you cheek to jowl the massive head at first glance looking like a pony's later you decided against the name dino it was too dig he was too dignified for a name like that you said what did i think of chance chauncey diego watson rolf arlo alfie any of those names sounded fine to me in the end you called him apollo Wife three asks if I knew a certain friend of yours who committed suicide just months before you did. We never met, I say, though you had told me about him. While that poor man was in terrible health, he had emphysema, cancer, angina and diabetes. His quality of life was frankly rotten. You, on the other hand, had been in excellent health and so on. So you get a kind of flavour of that book, which is a really beautiful, brilliant, lovely read which I thoroughly recommend to all and would say it's a great one to read um, potentially if you are bereaved um, or if you have been bereaved in the not too distant past because it very much is about grief and a woman who's in the process of grief. Another, another book which I think is fantastic bibliotherapy in a different way so we've moved from Moby Dick, which is all about vengeance and obsession. And it's also a rollicking good tale with quite a lot of deep diving into blubber and a lot of um, negativity about the um, seeming horror of the beast that is Moby Dick. Then we've moved to this much more healing, positive, quiet and gentle book about grief. Um, this is actually a comedy novel, Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus, which everyone is raving about at the moment, and rightly so, because it is a really fantastic, upbeat read, though it does have quite a lot of sadness in it. And also, it's a very wise and brilliant book, as well as being funny. So, uh it's all about Elizabeth Zott, a chemist who's determined to research abiogenesis, the chemistry version of researching the Big Bang. So she is basically trying to discover the secrets of the universe. She has enormous ambitions. However, as a woman in the 1950s, she faces insurmountable hurdles. Society's lessons in chemistry included her rape, which is in a backstory, then expulsion from a PhD programme in retaliation for complaining against the rapist. So there's quite a lot of heavy stuff going on, even though it is, you know, it's mostly a comedy, but it does have a lot of um, hard hitting reality about what it was like to be a woman in the 1950s. So she's hired on a ridiculously low salary at a research centre where she is giving all her expertise to men who don't give her any credit and she's also expected of course to make her to make their coffee act as a lab technician generally shut up and put up with whatever they want to um, however they want to make use of her and not get any credit for any of the ac academic brilliance that she brings to the research center which is all somewhat tragic however 
she fell in love with the one man that took her seriously, Calvin Evans. And she decides not to marry him because she wants to keep her name, pursue her work and gain credibility in the scientific community. It's a really wonderful read. And the reason I'm talking about it tonight is because there's a fabulous dog in this book called 630, which is uh, a great name for a dog, quite an unexpected one. And it's uh, a dog who is actually very important in many plot pivotal points. And I'm just going to read you a little bit about what Bunny, Bonnie Garmus, the writer of the book, said about the dog. She says, one of the book's themes is underestimation. Elizabeth, the heroine, Elizabeth Zott, is underestimated, but she never underestimates anyone else, including her dog. And that's one of the reasons that we love 630, the dog, and that we love Elizabeth, because Elizabeth thinks that she can actually train the dog to speak, or not to speak, but to understand words. And she trains the dog to understand at least 400 words, which is pretty impressive. Um, so Elizabeth says about the dog 630, why she called it 630. 630 is actually based on a dog I've had, but her name was Friday. She was a shelter animal who'd been very badly abused. I really didn't want to adopt this dog. And then she turned out to be this kind of brilliant dog who picked up a lot of language just like 6.30 does in Lessons in Chemistry. We taught her commands like sit and stay, but she would learn words we were using in conversation. I have a habit of saying, I don't know where my keys are. And after a while, Friday would just look in all the usual places as if saying, they're right here. She was just incredible. And actually that does happen in the book. We find 6.30, the dog, doing lots of miraculous things like finding the heroine's keys and clearly that is based on Bonnie Garmus's real experience. Then also Bonnie Garmus did have a dog called 99. 99, the dog, comes from a show called Get Smart, a TV show from the 60s. Um, Bonnie Garmus says, when I was growing up in Southern California I had a best friend and we spent all our time together. We called each other 86 and 99 from the show Get Smart. And we continued to do that our entire lives. She died 10 years in a tragic accident. And I named my dog 99 for the friend. So that's why in this book, the dog who is a brilliant, heroic and fabulous character is called 630. And if you want to find out more about the dog 630, who is a fabulous character, Read Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. Great novel. Now, moving on from dogs, uh, and I do realise that we could do a whole session on dogs, um, I'm going to talk about this elephant, The Elephant's Journey by Jose Saramago, which is based on a true story. History attests that in 1551, an elephant made the journey from Lisbon to Vienna, escorted by officers of King Zhao III of Portugal, then by officers of the Archduke Maximilian of Austria. Solomon the elephant, so this is Solomon here, and his mahout had already made a long sea voyage from Goa and spent a couple of years standing about in a pen in Lisbon before setting off for Valladolid as a present from the king to the archduke, who travelled with him to Italy by ship and across the Alps to Vienna. In this novel, Solomon and his mahout, Subro, proceed through various landscapes at an unhurried pace, attended by various functionaries and military men, and meeting along the way with villagers and townsfolk who variously interpret the sudden enigma of an elephant entering their lives. That is the story. It's a slow, gentle, ponderous story like the elephant. But it's also extremely funny. Old Saramago, because he, he wrote this in his latter years, possibly when he was in his 80s, I think, 
writes with a masterfully light hand, and the humour is tender, a mockery so tempered with patience and pity that the sting is gone, though the wit remains vital. So it's a really gorgeous book, um, which very much looks into the mind, character and soul of an elephant. But also it's all about all the people that the elephant meets on the way as he walks on this epic journey. And I'm just going to read you a little bit to give you a flavour of this lovely, gentle, slow paced, but very healing book. Ten days after this conversation, when the sun had barely appeared above the horizon, Solomon finally left the enclosure in which he had languished for two years. The convoy was precisely as the king had ordered, with the mahout, who presided from on high, seated on the elephant's back. The two men who were there to help him in whatever way proved necessary. The other men in charge of food supplies, the ox cart bearing the water trough, which the bumps in the road constantly sent sliding from one side to the other, as well as gigantic loads of fodder of varying types. The cavalry troop who were responsible for security along the way and the safe arrival of all concerned. And finally, something that the king had not thought of, the quartermaster's wagon drawn by two mules. The absence of curious onlookers and other witnesses could be explained by the extremely early hour and the secrecy that had shrouded the departure. Although there was one exception, a royal carriage that set off in the direction of Lisbon as soon as Elephant and Company had disappeared around the first bend in the road. Inside were the King of Portugal, Dom Jao III, and his Secretary of State, Pet Pero de Alcavova Camero, whom we may not see again, although perhaps we will, because life laughs at predictions and introduces words where we imagine silences and sudden returns when we thought we would never see each other again. I'd forgotten the meaning of the Mahout's name, what it was again, the King was asking. White, sir, Subaru means white, although you'd never think it to look at him. In a room in the palace, in the gloom of the bed canopy, the sleeping queen is having a nightmare. She is dreaming that Solomon has been taken from Belém and that she keeps asking everyone, why didn't you tell me? But when she does finally decide to wake up around mid-morning, she will not repeat that question and cannot be sure that she, on her own initiative, ever will. It may be that in the next few years, someone will chance to mention the word elephant in her presence. And then the Queen of Portugal... Catherine of Austria will say, speaking of elephants, whatever happened to Solomon? Is he still in Belém or has he already been dispatched for Vienna? And when they tell her that he is indeed in Vienna, living in a kind of zoological garden along with the other wild animals, she will respond, feigning innocence. What a fortunate creature there. He is enjoying life in the most beautiful city in the world. And here am I, trapped between today and the future and with no hope in either of them. The king, if he's present will pretend not to hear and the Secretary of State the same Pero de Alcova Canero, whom we've already met, even though he's not a man given to praying. We need only recall what he said about the Inquisition and more importantly, what he thought best not to say, will offer up a silent prayer to heaven asking for the elephant to be enveloped in a thick cloak of oblivion that will so disguise his shape that he could be mistaken by lazy imaginations for that other strange looking beast, the dromedary, or some other type of camel whose unfortunate two-humped appearance would be likely to linger in the memory of anyone interested in these insignificant events. The past is an immense area of stony ground that many people would like to drive across as if it were a motorway, while others move patiently from stone to stone, lifting each one because they need to know what lies beneath. Sometimes scorpions crawl out, or centipedes, fat white caterpillars or ripe chrysalises. But it's not impossible that at least once an elephant might appear and that the elephant might carry on its shoulders a mahout named Subro, meaning white, an entirely inappropriate word to describe the man who, in the sight of the king of Portugal and his secretary of state, appeared in the enclosure in Belém, looking every bit as filthy as the elephant he was supposed to be taking care of. You can see when you start reading Saramago, it's very difficult to stop, partly because of the way he writes in an unpunctuated flow that makes you rather breathless and want to read quite fast, but also because he is incredibly funny, interesting, witty, philosophical and profound. And his other book, Blindness, is one of my favourite ever novels.
which is an excellent book all about a plague of blindness, but not one that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, now, one of you uh, lovely people in the audience earlier on today mentioned one of their favourite characters, uh, literary animals in literature, is um, the dog in Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome, which is a superb novel, which is very funny, written in 1889, believe it or not. And this is a book with great humour. It was written originally, it was meant to be a travel book, but it morphed into something much more anecdotal. And it's all about misadventures on while travelling with uh, themes like putting up a tent, getting lost in a hedge maze, fishermen lying, and the, the joy of it is it's absolutely perfectly executed and highly entertaining. The dog in the book is called Montmorency, and he is, I think he's a Jack Russell, um, he is a great character within the novel. So there's the three men in the boat plus the dog. His ambition in life is to get in the way and be sworn at. If he can squirm anywhere where he's not really wanted and be a perfect nuisance and make people mad and have things thrown at his head, then he feels that his day has not been wasted. He loves to get people to stumble over him, curse at him steadily, and uh, he generally gets in the way, drives people mad, finds other dogs to play with to get under your heels and creates chaos. But he's uh, a really excellent character who is much loved by all that read the novel. So I wonder if there's any other fans of Montmorency out there this evening. I'm trying to get onto comments uh, on Facebook and I'm not seeing them. If anyone does have comments, um, maybe send them to me on uh, Instagram if you can, because I will see them there. So Instagram watchers, do tell me if you've got favourite animals in novels, because I'd love to know what they are. And Facebook people, if you can, send me a comment on Instagram. Now, Damien himself was mentioning earlier that he has been deeply traumatised by the novel Watership Down by Richard Adams, which is an amazing, brilliant, shocking novel, which is responsible for many a scar in people's lives. The film that was released in the 1980s is possibly even more scarring than the novel. I think the novel is fantastic and I would totally recommend it to all. And it seems to be a book that's getting a lot of favour currently at the moment. I meet a lot of bibliotherapy clients in the States currently who are reading Watership Down or have recently read it. I wonder why that is. But it's a great book. Uh, it's one of those books in which the characters that are animals are clearly highly based on real human events and are satirical versions of political parties and political events in Richard Adams' time. And um, Adams was very much a um, believer in animal rights. He also wrote a brilliant and re another really disturbing book called The Plague Dogs, which is all about dogs who were being um, used for vivisection purposes. And it's a really traumatising, awful, tragic and not a book that I would say is great for bibliotherapy. However, Watership Down, on the other hand, is very good for bibliotherapy. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But in Watership Down, there is a fantastically grim, awful character called General Wound Wart. Uh, he is a great literary villain in the form of a rabbit. He's almost big as a hare. He rears up late in the book to dominate the third section of the novel. He's the leader of F. Rafa, 
an oppressed, overcrowded warren, which he runs along the lines of a Stasi state, crushing political dissent in the name of security. Watership Down was, of course, once billed as a children's book, but actually I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a great one for children to read, <laughs> even though many of us did in our formative years, and we have been deeply scarred as a result, uh, Damien included. And I must say, whenever I go past a rabbit warren now, I still see it as uh, that Stasi state run by General Woundwort. But I also have faith in the rabbits who might prevail. Uh, the main character in the book is Fiverr, who is an incredibly sensitive, artistic rabbit who perhaps prevails in the end, but I won't give any spoilers away. So do read Watership Down if you can. So David was asking me earlier, what would be uh, an appropriate bibliotherapy cure for having read Watership Down? Which is a great question, because actually, I don't know if anyone's asked me that before, for a cure, a bibliotherapy cure for another book. So Watership Down is a book that scars you deeply because of what happens to many an innocent rabbit. And I think a very good antidote to that would be one of my favourite books, The Year of the Hare by Arto Pasolina, which is a Finnish book written in 1974, which is all about a man who goes out one day to do a job. He's He's in his 50s, having a midlife crisis, and he goes into the countryside in Finland with his work colleague. They're on a kind of journalistic mission, and they accidentally, while they're driving, they hit a hare, a young leveret, and they, um, the hero, Vatanen, goes and picks up the hare, realises that it's injured, and then this is where it gets interesting because he decides not to go back into the car, but to keep walking into the forest with the hare. And this book is then about the relationship between the man and the hare and how they go off on a walk for the next year together in the wilderness. And the reason I think it's a great antidote to um, Watership Down is because the book is completely the opposite of it really. In Watership Down, the rabbits, we're, we are given um, entry into the thoughts of the rabbits. We we completely witness their innermost thoughts and they are very much um, versions of humanity. They're given very human characteristics. In the year of the hare, however, the hare is actually completely just a hare and the man is a man and they're just having a completely ordinary relationship as man and hare, but they have rather fabulous and brilliant um, adventures together, which are of a picaresque variety. And they are, um, it's a really, it's a short book. It's only probably about 150 pages or less. And it was a book that has become a massively successful cult novel written in 1974, widely read throughout Europe. It's a fin Finnish book and it's now um, got its kind of cult following. So that's The Year of the Hair by Arto Pasolina. And I think it's a perfect antidote to people who've been scarred by reading Watership Down, uh, which is a very traumatising novel. Um, however, I was also going to just mention another reason why it is a great read. And I'm just, um, for bibliotherapy purposes, just searching in the novel Cure, because I know that we wrote about it in the novel Cure as a cure for anxiety, I do believe. Uh, hang on a minute, just finding that. Mm, it's not coming up. I'm going to be flicking through that 
while I speak to you about other things and then I'm going to come back to it in a minute. Um, meanwhile, I did want to talk about another couple of great books which are excellent cures for having read Watered It Down. And I'm also realising that I'm running out of time, so I might have to come back to that Watered It Down moment. Um, the Travelling Cat Chronicles. So this is another excellent cure for having read Water Ship Down because it's another novel which is very much healing and very much about the positive power of animals in human lives. So Water Ship Down is all about what humans do um, in a terrible way to animals. Whereas The Travelling Cat Chronicles, thanks Helen for joining in, is a wonderful book about a cat called Nana, who is the heroine of this novel. And it's a very gentle, lovely, beautiful book, all about the relationship between a cat and a man. Um, I'm just trying to find for you my notes on this novel. Um, it is a Japanese novel. The Japanese are fascinated by cats and there are many shrines dedicated to cats in Japan. There are even cat cafes where people go to pet cats in Japan and hang out with them. Um, there's beckoning good luck cats who appear in Asian shops, ensuring the success and prosperity of their enterprises. And Japanese authors often love to write about cats, for instance, in Sei Shonagon's pillow book, whoops, uh, the, the Emperor Ichigo, the earliest Japanese emperor, um, loses his cat at one point and everyone has to go and look for it. So there's many a famous cat in Japanese literature. Uh, Murakami loves to write about cats as well. Centuries later, after the pillow book, uh, Natsume Soseiko produced his three volume masterpiece, I Am a Cat, over a period of two years, which went into three volumes because everyone wanted more of the cat. They wanted more and more um, cat therapy. I do think that reading about cats in itself can be highly bibliotherapeutic. Uh, there's also a detective cat in Japan, fictional, I hasten to add, called uh, by author Jiro Akugawa. And the detective cat is named Holmes, who can understand human language and has strange deductive powers, which he uses to team up with a policeman and solve crimes. This also reminds me of Barjack Poor, a fabulous children's book, which I absolutely love, um, which is all about uh, cats with rather fantastic deductive and uh, Nintendo-like powers. So this book... Uh, is a bit different from the others, featuring a cat who travels with his owner in a silver van. And it's about memories, as Satoru, who is the hero, reunites with his aunt, Noriko, who had a hand in raising him. And Nana, the cat, relives the owner, Satoru's past, as they go travelling together in their silver van and meeting various people from Satoru's past. And we slowly realise, as the book unfolds, why this is happening, why Satoru is travelling around with his cat. In fact, we don't slowly realise it. We realise right at the end, and I won't give it away. But it is a really beautiful and rather sad narrative, um, but I won't reveal why. But it's incredibly beautifully told and Nana the Cat is a really gorgeous character which is incredibly sympathetic. And I'll just read you a tiny bit knowing that time is going to run out. I am a cat. As yet, I have no name. There's a famous cat in our country who once made this very statement. I have no clue how great that cat was, but at least when it comes to having a name, I got there first. Whether I like my name is another matter, since it glaringly doesn't fit my gender, me being male and all. I was given it about five years ago, around the time I came of age. 
Back then, I used to sleep on the bonnet of a silver van in the parking lot of an apartment building. Why there? Because no one would ever shoo me away. Human beings are basically huge monkeys that walk upright, but they can be pretty full of themselves. They leave their cars exposed to the elements, put a few paw prints on the paintwork and they go ballistic. At any rate, the bonnet of that silver van was my favourite place to sleep. The even in winter, the sun made it all warm and toasty, the perfect spot for a daytime nap. I stayed there until spring arrived, which meant I'd survived one whole cycle of seasons. One day I was lying curled up, having a snooze, when I suddenly sensed a warm, intense gaze upon me. I unglued my eyelids a touch and saw a tall, lanky young man, eyes narrowed, staring down at me as I lay prone. So that's the very beginning of the Travelling Cat Chronicles, which, for anyone unfamiliar with that, is a really lovely read. And Nana the Cat is a fantastic character, observing his owner and observing human life around him and discovering his owner's past as they go travelling together, meeting various people in their silver van. Um, now, I just wanted to end with another fabulous animal from literature, which is Monkey by Wu Cheng En. And so we've had dogs, cats, the whale, the elephant. We're not talking about chickens tonight because I'm going to save them for a special session devoted to Damien and his fabulous chickens. All about chickens in literature coming soon. Um, but I just thought it would be great to end with Monkey uh, from the Chinese ancient tale by Wu Cheng En. And it's a fantastic read all about a kind of divine monkey. And I know that's going against what I said at the beginning of the session that I was only going to be talking about real characters. But Monkey's such a great character that I couldn't resist talking about him just briefly. So we have Monkey in the novel Cure as a cure for resistance to change. And I'll just quickly read why we have that entry. Some of us like to sit like a boulder on a hill, unmoving since time began. Perhaps we've gathered some lichen over the years, comfortable, safe, confident with who we are. The last thing we want to do is change. Then along comes a fluctuation in the climate, or perhaps a passing troll. Before we know it, we're cracked, our composure spoiled, and our well-made plans awry. Suddenly we find ourselves rolling down the mountain to land, and with what emerging from our cracks. So this is our cure in the novel cure for resistance to change. And the cure is Monkey by Wu Chang En. It's understandable to be nervous of change. We get used to our comfortable crannies and the idea of climbing out of them is frightening. To deviate or question our perceived norms makes us feel vertiginous and we wonder who we are, provoking a crisis of identity. But change is essential for growth and development and fear of change is no reason to resist it. Exhilarating proof of the essential mutability of life, we offer you The Joyous Monkey, written by a Ming Dynasty Chinese hermit and poet in the 16th century. It too begins with a rock. Since the creation of the world, this rock has absorbed the pure essences of heaven, the vigour of sunshine and the grace of moonlight. Then it becomes pregnant and gives birth to a stone egg, and out of the egg comes Monkey. Monkey is an irreverent, powerful beast with a delight in life that has him soon fearlessly embracing the 72 polymorphic transformations taught to him by a Taoist immortal. One day, he learns to cloud trapeze, hitching a ride on a cloud from one end of the world to another and even into the heavens themselves. And the next, he learns to turn the hairs of his body into other things, from armies to paintbrushes. He acquires a magical staff that he can tuck behind his ear the size of a needle or growing if he commands it to the size of the Milky Way. Indeed, Monkey's adaptability and ability to create at whim poses such a challenge in 
the size of the Milky Way. Sorry, poses such a challenge, suddenly lost it. Uh, now I can't see where I am. Monkey's adaptability poses such a challenge to the heavens that the Buddha decides to lock him into a mountain for 500 years to teach him some humility. That's a great passage in the book when he gets locked into the mountain for 500 years. His final trans monkey's final transformation is to embrace the monkish wisdom and learn moderation, but he's still always happy to take on a new role, siding the young monk Tripitaka on his own spiritual quest. Stop sitting pretty in your inflexible sameness. Burst open like the boulder on the mountain and discover the exhilaration of change and reinvention of self. You too have wisdom to attain, perhaps a pilgrim to assist, a kingdom to run. You might even find out how to use clouds as vaults, which will launch you to the heavens. So that's Monkey by Wu Cheng En, which in the novel Cure we have as a cure for resistance to change. It's a really great read. It's pretty crazy. And Monkey is a fabulous character who is utterly irreverent and rather joyous. And on that positive and upbeat note, I will leave you for this evening. Uh, but thanks so much for joining me. Just to mention a couple of the books that you all mentioned as well. Um, there was Timbuktu by Paul Oster, um, one of you mentioned. Uh, thanks so much for mentioning that. It's a fabulous book which I have read, which I was actually also recommended by someone on Twitter and uh, was very grateful to have that recommendation because that is an absolutely brilliant novel all about another dog called um, Timbuktu. And it's very sad. It's about a homeless man, but it is an excellent, lovely read. And... I know there was one other great one that was mentioned, which was, oh, it's by Bridget Brophy, and it's a book, another book about a monkey, which I haven't read, and which I really want to read, and now I can't find the title of it, but thank you to the lovely person on Twitter who did mention it. I found it now, Hackenfeller's Ape by Bridget Brophy. Um, thanks to Kate Levy for mentioning that. And that sounds like a fab read. It's all about Percy, the rare ape, caged in a London zoo with his mate. Professor Daryl Hyde longs to witness the ape's mating ritual, but Percy, inhibited by confinement, will not oblige. As the professor stands by the cage singing Mozart, their empathy increases. That sounds like a brilliant read, and I love Bridget Brophy having only recently discovered her when I read The Snowball, which is a great novel, which I read during lockdown, and that's all about a ball in the 1960s in London. So thanks so much for joining me tonight. It's been lovely talking about various animals in literature. If anyone has any favourite animals in literature, which I have not mentioned, I'd love to hear from you. Tell me what they are. And... I wonder if you love them because of positive thoughts about them or more negative thoughts about them, such as Watership Down and its traumatising aspects. I will see you again very soon. I'll be back in a month's time. My dates are all slightly strange at the moment because there's various things going on, which means I'm not doing it in the middle of the month. So watch this space. Keep going to the Damien Bar Literary Salon website. Also check us out on Instagram and Facebook and see what's going on. And watch out for the next Bibliotherapy Session Live. Thanks so much for joining me and have a great night.